Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you allow me to start the meeting. Well, my name is Cristian Diaconescu, and I'm extremely honored for the invitation which have been addressed by um, New Strategy Center and the organizers of these um, meetings and very substantive dialogue um, organization in order to moderate this panel. The panel is called Classic and Hybrid Challenges on NATO's Eastern Flank, Building a Better Common Threats Understanding. At the outset, I should like to express my gratitude to the distinguished representatives uh, who are together with me in this afternoon in order to address this very significant issue for the security of Romania, of the region, and why not of the whole North Atlantic Alliance. I should start by saying that um, uh, Mr. Nicolae Ciucca, a very good friend of us and uh, one of the main key, not only, only speakers, but also political determined representatives, uh, should have to attend uh, a meeting of the government. It was an incidental meeting, like is happening in Romania, and uh, from time to time, even the military establishment should take a break in front of the politics. It is happening here, it is happening also in some other countries. So uh, having in mind that uh, Mr. Chuka will be with his mind and his soul together with us, yes, of course, also together with the political party and the government, um, I should like to introduce at the very beginning, uh, Madam State Secretary Simona Kojokaru, uh, really one of the most significant professionalists of the Minister of Defense, and not only, and I'm uh, extremely sure that her contributions in our seminar will be a substantive and a very important one. Together with us, of course, uh, as you have been informed at the very beginning, there will be General Curtis Scaparotti, former Supreme uh, Allied Commander of Europe, confirmed via VTC, and also, and I welcome him, a very good friend of us, and one of the main um, representatives of a very positive, substantive, and important thinking with regard to security in Europe, General Sir James Everard, former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Before kindly asking um, our guests, to address the working group. Please allow me to enter in some preliminary remarks with regard to our meeting today here. Well, we discuss about challenges, NATO, Eastern flank, and what to do. From the very beginning, I should like to say that practically what do we have here? What is in the picture? Hopefully that uh, our discussions today, and I warmly invite you to take part in these deliberations after the presentations of our um, case speakers. We have a quite complicated picture. You are fully aware about this issue. Allow me just to point out some of the relevant, as I humbly considered, points of reference which are covering our subject, what we have in Southeast. We have the Black Sea. Around the Black Sea, we have uh, member states of NATO and the European Union, member states only of NATO, member states in the uh, accession process to the European Union, member states of the community of the Black Sea who are rejecting particular NATO, but also European Union. We have mass protests in Belarus. 
a smoldering Russia, Russian-Ukrainian war, erosion of the power system in Russia, the war between two Eastern Partnership countries, Azerbaijan and Armenia, which was concluding on the basis of a bilateral agreement between Turkey and Russia and not within the framework of Minsk group of the multilateral framework, namely OSCE, a frozen conflict in Transnistria, the evolving situation in the Republic of Moldova, the implications, relevance, and interests coming from the United States, NATO, and the European Union, a third crisis developing in the row in the European Union, namely Eurozone 2008-2009, immigration problem, 2015-2016, COVID-19, nowadays, hopefully, for a short period of time going on. But also, which is relevant, at least from my point of view, elections in three largest European Union countries, member states. After NATO summit in Warsaw in 2016, as you are fully aware, they adopted new and more robust measures with regard to the region, with regard to the eastern part of the region. Establish an enhanced forward presence in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, and a tailored response presence of the alliance with regard to the Black Sea region and the countries around it, Ripadian countries. It was supposed, having in mind this understanding of the North Atlantic Alliance, that we shall have unambiguously demonstration allies solidarity. I should like to underscore this word, solidarity. Determination and ability to act by triggering an immediate allied response to any aggression. In practice, we speak about here about multinational forces. These multinational forces should be led by framework nations on a voluntary base and a sustainable one equally. So, overall strategy with regard to Eastern Frank should be summarized, at least from my point of view, having in mind deterrence, defense, and yes, why not, meaningful dialogue with Russia. Practically the whole strategy I mentioned briefly here is designed for the more likely cases when a relatively small skirmish, which might happen any time, in any moment, possibly unintended one, but also, and it should be important from this point of view, which might be also provocative, in order to test NATO reaction, but with a real potential of spillover into a larger war. In my former lives, I heard this type of threatening premises with regard to Southeast Europe so many times. In order to cope with this uh, type of situation, of course, NATO's forward presence is meant to discourage Russia. Of course, for mis escalating in such areas and to give Moscow reasons to seek non-military solutions. Nowadays, NATO is a little bit divided. I want to be a, a little bit much more pushy from this point of view, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, different points of view. 
And uh, also, it's not a particular question, but a certain kind of address, NATO does not want to become bogged down in any conflict here in the south part of the transatlantic and European, not only economic, but also security area. Allow me, after this introduction, to pass the floor to Secretary of State Simona Kojokaro. Please, Madam, address our meeting. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Yes. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Your Excellencies, distinguished audience, it's great to be back here at the University of uh, Agronomic Sciences and Veterinary Medicine, actually third time in two days. Uh, and I would like to praise the New Strategy Center for your efforts to uphold the tradition of the forum. As many, many of you remember, um, New Strategy Center did an outstanding job to keep the continuity of the forum by organizing it even in 2020 under very challenging circumstances due to COVID-19. So congratulations uh, and Ministry of Defense is fully supporting your efforts. I salute General Scaparotti via VTC and I'm most delighted to be in this panel moderated by Ambassador Diaconescu with General Everard here in Bucharest. Classic and hybrid challenges for the eastern flank of NATO is a generous and rather exhaustive topic. And as I have a limited uh, amount of time at my disposal, I will concentrate my remarks on those challenges directly affecting the Black Sea region. And I would also touch upon the ways and means to overcome the challenges within NATO framework and as part of the Bucharest 9 initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to begin by mentioning a point that I myself and others have made many times, but bears repeating. We operate today in a very complex security environment, both classic and hybrid challenges meet in puzzle that evolves continuously. Put simply, we are now seeing malign behaviors and we need to be ready to adapt and to anticipate and to develop the proper capabilities to cope with these developments. It is highly demanding, but we need to be creative and able to balance among them in order to provide our citizens the required level of security. In that endeavor, using all tools beyond national efforts or in addition to those represents an important added value. An adequate response to hybrid warfare requires a substantially different approach compared to other military threats, respectively increasing the resilience to hybrid threats. In that vein, hybrid challenges are a very important topic for NATO and EU as well. EU defense ministers just met in, in Ljubljana and the topic of resilience was also on the agenda. Resilience is a top priority for Romania. First, we need to better anticipate trends and understand their possible implications. Second, the recovery dimension of the resilience merits more attention. Anticipating, preventing, withstanding, responding to the challenges are all very important efforts. We should identify options on how best to recover from shocks, how to restore essential services, how to resume critical state functions. Third, the partnership dimension is also very, very important in this construct. Supporting our partners in building their resilience is vital. We should not forget in this endeavor our close vicinity, Western Balkans, Eastern partners, Mediterranean countries. We should offer support by helping them to build capacities in order to withstand and respond to 
those various challenges. This is, at the end of the day, an investment in our security. Fourth, the approach to resilience should be, should remain a whole of government effort as the ministries of defense are not necessarily the first responders in this area. There is a need to educate ourselves and develop our ability in dealing with hybrid threats, including fake news disinformation. We do expect that the recently established Euro Atlantic Center for Resilience in Bucharest will soon contribute to the wider European and transatlantic intellectual debate on resilience, together with the European Cyber Center, Security Center, it will provide an innovative nexus in support to our common objectives. We are already familiar with the propaganda campaigns which aims to recover, to reignite old historical issues, to create or depend the social, political, or economic fractures to hamper regional cooperation, to undermine solidarity, and also the trust in Euro Atlantic institutions, both NATO and EU, and last but not the least, to shake the public opinion trust in democratic systems and institutions. It is an obvious articulated strategy aiming to spread of fake news, to promote conspiracy theories, and to increase Euro skepticism. The Russian hybrid and assertive actions are most probable to continue or to increase in range and amplitude. This scenario has the possibility to directly affect not only the Black Sea region, but also the whole Euro-Atlantic space. Other challenges, of course, are represented by the emergence of new technologies, such as artificial intelligence, big data, advanced analy analytics, quantum. This generates massive opportunities, but also major challenges. Moreover, NATO eastern flank, Countries are also affected by migrants using East Mediterranean and Balkan routes on their way to the Western countries. A factor that might influence the level of migration flow is represented, of course, by the revolutions in Afghanistan following the withdrawal of NATO forces, a significant deterioration of the security situation there, resulting in increased migration flows towards EU NATO countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Back to square one, Black Sea. Unlike the southern and western Europe, which are exposed to unconventional factors such as illegal immigration from the Middle East and North Africa towards Europe and isolated terrorist incidents, the eastern Europe is mostly exposed to Russian assertiveness. In the Black Sea region, Russia continues to strive for representing the dominant sector its policies being driven by the geopolitical and security objectives. This has a direct impact on Western Balkans, Eastern Mediterranean, and MENA security developments. So its resurgence uh, as a naval power has made the biggest waves in the Black Sea, where it has sought to create a new sphere of influence. One of the most powerful military tools, and I'm sure I'm not saying something new at all, is directed to A2AD systems, which forms a security belt covering the border from Arctic, the Barents Sea, Baltic Sea, and recently it has extended to Mediterranean Sea. So, we need a similar kind of strategic and operational approach from NATO is a requirement. Much remains to be accomplished in the Black Sea. There is no other feasible option for the European and regional security but to strengthen NATO deterrence and defense posture in the Black Sea and to achieve the full operational maturity of the tailored for our presence here. Romania is massively continuing its efforts to implement in full tailored for presence related measures and projects on all dimensions. But there is a need for a light additional contributions to ensure that operational maturity that I was speaking about and credibility at the end of the day. 
and effectiveness for the Allied collective posture developed at the Black Sea. So it is time to switch from a national to an Allied-based approach on TFP implementation and effectiveness to switch in full, I mean. The security challenges for the Eastern Allies, B9 countries, Bucharest 9, are facing cannot be confronted in the absence of a strong regional cooperation and defense and security related aspects. Romania, together with Poland, achieved significant steps toward consolidation of this format. It became a forum of regular consultations and exchanges at highest level of state of um, head of states and government, ministers of foreign affairs, and minister of defense. Even the times are challenging, we managed to make the best use of this format and to continue to build a common understanding and approach to current threats and challenging affecting NATO's eastern flank. We'll continue to do so, and uh, we hope to have a follow-up process to the B9 head of states and government meeting that took place in May this year in Bucharest. Ladies and gentlemen, I will end this intervention by saying that today there is an increased awareness that coherence and cohesion are very much needed, as both values are regularly tested through various conventional and unconventional means. We are stepping up our deterrence and resilience, but we have to do it together. A resilient state requires the development of national mechanism of rapid and efficient response and the solid security culture among its citizens. And I think this forum in which we are all participating these days is part of building such a solid security culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam State Secretary, for your substantive uh, address and very important issues you underscored for our forum here. Um, I should like to go on now. I should like to invite General Curtis Caparotti, former Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Dear friend, please, you have the floor. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Can you hear me? Ambassador, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Please go on. Okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for the warm welcome and, and your introduction. I'm pleased to take part in this panel and, uh, and be a part uh, of your security seminar. I wish I were there in person because I can see there are many friends there, and uh, I wish I were present with them. In particular, I'm pleased to be on this panel with uh, with two professionals, uh, Secretary uh, Kojikaru and also uh, my good friend, General Sir James Everhard, who I worked alongside with at NATO. My greetings uh, and warm greetings to both of you. So this morning, I intend to focus my brief opening comments on three points. Russia's emboldened. It has stepped up its game in recent months, in my opinion. Secondly, the Russian hybrid type war has no line between peace and conflict as we do in the West. And third, that what steps we should take to better address uh, this aggressive Russia um, that we have today. As we meet today, our governments around the world continue to grapple with a deadly pandemic that's already claimed the lives of 4.5 million people. At the same time, climate change has accelerated to what some experts assess is a rapidly approaching point of no return. And amid these substantial calamities, both Russia and China have leveraged opportunities to reshape the international system and realize the revisionist objectives. Ambassador, we could add to this your very good uh, summary that focused uh, on the Eastern flank um, as you opened. So as those of you who live and work in the Eastern flank of Europe know, an emboldened Russia has been adept and I think more brazen in its activities in recent months. Conventionally, it has added air and other military forces in the high north and continued to reconstruct a band of Cold War bases in the Arctic. 
This spring, Russia used a large force exercise to threaten in Ukraine and redeploy troops along its border, despite Russian reports to the contrary. We've also seen an expanded Black Sea Fleet be more aggressive in close encounters with NATO and national air and naval assets in order to contest innocent passage of the territorial waters around Crimea and to gain greater control of the strategic Black Sea region, in my opinion. The quote warning of HMS Defender this past June is a prominent example. Extending their reach from the Black Sea, the Russians have continued to build a port in, in Tartus, Syria and to deploy forces in Eastern Med. Let's not forget the integration of Russian forces in Belarus and the migration crisis that likely has a Russian hand, or that Zapad military exercises are about to begin with a normal ambiguity that drives valid concerns in Eastern Europe. This threatening posture and the simultaneous modernization of Russian forces have been coupled with Russia's primary line of effort persistent influence campaigns to undermine Western governments and institutions. These hybrid activities include interference in foreign elections, espionage, disinformation to heighten social issues and tensions, and cyber infiltration of critical infrastructure. Even more subtle disinformation through official statements that discount or deny assertive Russian operations and actions are forms of hybrid influence. In effect, the use of conventional force movements to reinforce their information campaign. As one can see, and we know from Russia's doctrine, Russia's hybrid type of war has no line between peace and conflict, as we in the West like to think. It is a continuum that includes conventional military activities where beneficial to realize political objectives. Russia's hybrid war includes diplomatic, informational, and economic activities and is designed to realize its objectives by creating destabilization and undermining the confidence of our peoples and their governments and institutions like NATO. Our subdued response, and perhaps the comforting thought that we are not at, quote, war, as we could see it, provides Russia greater freedom of action and increases our security risk incrementally over time. So given this complex and dynamic environment and the ambiguity that Russia injects into it, how do we continue to develop a more unified, robust, collective response? So first, I think we must be clear-eyed and view Russian actions and plans through a Russian lens, not a Western one. In doing so, we're more likely to understand their strategy and anticipate their actions. Second, we must recognize that diplomatic, economic, information activities are integral to Russia's approach to hybrid war. In Russia's strategy, these diplomatic, economic, and information activities are only a few along a seam seamless continuum that includes various types of military movements, operations, and levels of conflict, as we have seen from Russia and Ukraine and in the Caucasus, in cyber attacks in France and UK, in European elections along the Polish border, around the Nord Cap of Norway, and off the coast of Sweden. NATO's eastern frontier is made of several nation states, bordering a single state. Where we see Northern Europe, Central Europe, and Southern Europe, Russia sees NATO and its partners. Yes, the threat of Russia from NATO's eastern flank is more direct, and Russia has a wider range of possible hybrid war activities to choose from. But one of the defining characteristics of hybrid war is that it can be conducted at range, deep behind NATO's flank in France, the UK, and the United States. We must develop an integrated strategy that is equally robust and responsive wherever Russia seeks to act, in whatever way and to whatever degree. To formally synchronize diplomatic information and economic intelligence, plans and actions with our military will require greater transparency and collaboration with NATO, with our partners and with the EU. Third. We must break down the barriers within our nations and among our nations that seek to protect information as a priority rather than to share it. We've begun to make some progress here when one looks at our successes in countering terrorism, but I think we can do much better. Fourth, we should develop a multinational regional team approach to collecting and analyzing intelligence. The nations in the regions are the experts in their region, and we should leverage regional expertise and develop a process that integrates input from the Nordic nations in the high north, the Baltics, the Black Sea, and the Med. We had begun to do this several years ago, but having retired, uh, I'm unaware of it if it's matured. I hope so. 
Fifth, we need to continue to pursue our modernization efforts to incorporate staff expertise in intel and cyber, while also embracing emerging technologies and improved weapon systems. Modern defense systems are able to connect information and intelligence from all our domains to provide remarkably comprehensive awareness of the situation and agility to our forces. The connectivity of cross queue of modern intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance systems, the ability to connect and team advanced five, fifth gen aircraft like the F-35 to enhance the lethality of fourth gen aircraft and cyber reconnaissance are just a few examples. Now, all of this requires a bias for interoperability. And then finally, my first point was about strategy and I'll close with a point on strategy. I believe in the need for a comprehensive NATO strategy for the defense of the Euro Atlantic. All our challenges and the reach of our adversaries transcends regional approaches and regional reactive thinking. As I departed NATO two years ago, it was developing a military strategy along these lines and captured in the DDA, the defense and deterrence of the Euro Atlantic. And I applaud the efforts here. This effort has to be matured and then nested in the new NATO strategic concept that is relevant to today and tomorrow's security environment and threats. I think much of what I had to say was, uh, was in line with the secretary as well. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. And, uh, and I look forward to the discussion and obviously uh, Sir James comments that follow mine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. General Scaparotti, for your um, enlightened presentations. Thank you very much for the stamped ideas and the uh, way you placed the real threats with regard to the southeast flank of um, North Atlantic Alliance. I'm moving on. I should like to kindly address to Sir James Everard, former Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Um, Mr. General, dear friend, please, you have the floor. Uh, Your Excellencies, CMC, uh, Chief of Defence Generals, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's been my honour to follow uh, General Scafarotti, and I do so again today. Uh, he was a wonderful boss, a great saccur, and actually the architect of many of the concepts that we are implementing in uh, the Alliance today. Um, let me start. Russia has significant domestic and foreign policy challenges, uh, and we should not forget this. But in her actions, Russia has shown that she understands not just the power of the information psychological sphere enabled by modern technology, the power of illicit money, but the continuing value of conventional military force. Russia's political leaders now have at their disposal large, well-equipped, credible, and increasingly effective nuclear and conventional armed forces capable of operating not just across the five operating domains, sea, land, air, space, and cyber, but also in a comprehensive manner, applying force across all the instruments of power, simultaneously and coherently. You know, Russia does not want a fight, but Russia is prepared to fight, and in the meantime is operating using the hybrid tools of disinformation, disruption, destabilization, and deception, all enabled by emerging and disruptive technologies, and because she carries a big stick, looming destruction, as classically demonstrated recently uh, along the borders of Ukraine, uh, all in order to achieve her strategic, operational, and tactical objectives. Uh, at the same time, COVID-19 has exposed the weakness and the fragility of allied nation states given our interdependence and our connectedness. Our vulnerabilities and over-dependencies have been further exposed, I think, by events in Afghanistan. To be clear, it's not the fact that the US decided to leave, but the manner of the negotiations that put domestic politics ahead of our commitment to the Afghan people, the silence of other allies despite their unease, and the nature of our departure. Clearly, no one expected the House of Cards in Afghanistan to fall so quickly, uh, but it did. And while I think this crisis will blow over, we are all embarrassed and exposed by our failure. You know, perceptions are important, and at this moment in time, we look unreliable, even weak and weakening. And this will further embolden Russia, 
and our adversaries, classic and hybrid challenges, will multiply. Um, three deductions. One, in the post-COVID, post-Afghan era, national resilience, the capacity to overcome difficulties and persevere at home and abroad, will become the defining test of a country's strength, not their openness to globalisation. Resilience abroad delivered primarily through the alliance and resilience at home delivered primarily by nation states. A national responsibility, but a collective commitment. And we can cooperate and we can pool uh, knowledge. Two, we need constantly good intelligence. Because as Saka has said, AOI deterrence and defence requires robust intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance feeding in enhanced uh, and integrated indicators and warning and early warning system uh, to anticipate threats, challenges and opportunities. Now, we have good, uh, made good progress here, uh, but we can do more. Um, on intelligence, let me just make one uh, important point. In the past, I've said that too many allies still believe that once exposed, a, a secret loses all its power. Um, intelligence sharing is not instinctive between uh, allies. However, we should now recognise that the gap between high-end military intelligence and open-source refined intelligence is often very small. Ask the right question on hybrid or classic challenges, and there are now commercial organisations who can complement uh, military intelligence and help us build a better and easily shared common threats understanding at very low cost. We should think about this. My third deduction is that the US and the Allies now need to get our collective act together. You know, smoke and mirrors uh, is not a strategy. The future of our democracy must be delivered from a position of strength. Uh, on a regional basis, I think we now need to prioritise collective defence and deliver on the commitments that we have made at the Brussels summit to, quote, strengthen our ability to turn and defend against any potential adversary and to maintain and develop our military advantage now and in the future. Uh, at the Brussels, uh, sorry, in the Brussels communique, our leaders uh, placed a renewed emphasis on collective defence and they also committed to the full implementation of the, the uh, concept for the deterrence uh, and defence of the Euro-Atlantic area a concept rooted in General Scaparotti's strategic thoughts when he was Sakur. They also committed to achieving uh, NATO baseline requirements for national resilience, uh, with a uh, centre for resilience uh, here in Romania, uh, under your Minister of Foreign Affairs, I hope providing a North Star uh, for the Alliance. You know, we need to deliver on all uh, this. And I just remind you, for those that don't know, that DDA and the plans that underpin it visualise the complex nature of modern warfare as a contest, you know, where deterrence uh, must demonstrate an intelligence-led and unambiguous ability to defend, and defence relies on controlling geographic areas and the multiple domains of warfare simultaneously. Uh, and DDA covers uh, all known and anticipated threats and developments from the seabed uh, to space. Uh, and the concept is now underpinned as General Scapp said, by an AOR-wide strategic plan, the first military strategic plan for the employment of the military, a military instrument of power uh, in crisis and conflict for 50 years. Uh, written, uh, not yet uh, approved. And so we are undoubtedly stronger together. We just need to demonstrate this. And I believe that Romania has a big part uh, to play. You know, Romania is not only a strong uh, NATO ally, but a bastion for NATO uh, in the Black Sea region, a region that is of great uh, importance in geostrategic terms and that has emerged as a hotspot for great power competition. There is no better testbed for the concepts that we are uh, developing, or indeed for developing a better common threats uh, understanding. I think if we can make our ideas work here in the Black Sea, we'll be able to make them work anywhere uh, on the eastern flank. And actually, the concept is elastic and could be applied to other threats. It, it, that is what uh, our political masters uh, required us to do. And so I hope that the, Romania can drive the alliance you know, hard. It must lead in the B9, it must lead in the alliance to assure that NATO delivers 
uh, on its commitments to secure uh, the Black Sea region. And just one final comment, really flowing from the last uh, debate. Um, I think we should remember the power of convergence, the growing power of convergence. This is the ability to concentrate efforts from across uh, all domains, air, land, uh, sea, and in the future, space, queued by IR systems, uh, with strike platforms held often well outside uh, the AOR often enabled by our own use of emerging and disruptive te technologies, particularly cyber and electromagnetic uh, and special forces. This, I think, is how we are going to uh, win in the future. And I hope that TFP can become the model that demonstrates uh, how we do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, General Sir James Everard. I should like to extend my gratitude to you and to all the panelists for the very substantive, important, and significant points of view which have been expressed here. And um, I'm sure that your ideas and uh, your uh, ways to understand and to submit uh, evaluation assessment with regard to uh, what is important for security and stability in the uh, southeast part of NATO also um, are um, equally important, substantive, but also will incite uh, the discussions. And um, now we enter in our second uh, moment of our gathering here, the Q&A session. Um, I should like to encourage you to address questions, to express your views with regard to uh, the presentations. Uh, also, I should like to encourage you to introduce yourselves um, when you are asking for the floor. Please, who wants to have questions, points of view? Allow me to start and um, to say that um, as uh, I understood uh, what was presented here from extremely re relevant personalities with a high level of knowledge about what is happening uh, not only in the eastern part of um, NATO but also with regard to the whole security and stability area, transatlantic area. Um, I think that um, there, are there were examples here of uh, factors which made it necessary for the countries located in this part of Europe, in the eastern flank of NATO, and European Union, to prepare for possib possible bad scenarios. Uh, we should demonstrate our ability inside NATO, within our decision-making process, political or military, but also outside, let's say, on a national basis, uh, the institution of Brussels, how we are able to face them. So um, I should be extremely grateful to our um, panelists. If they can consider and if they can submit to us some of the potential they see with regard to the countries in the region, what they can do, of course, to integrate, but not only, in order to coordinate their potential inside the region, but also in NATO as a whole. To what extent, practically, we should do it? In what direction we, sh we can work from this point of view? Maybe, if you can name them what are the structures of integration uh, which already exist and can be useful for uh, enhanced security uh, of our region. And why not? What might be the main challenge for these countries, for our countries? And one constitutes the more the um, real shortcomings in this regard, if you can address them, in resisting and having a certain kind of um, positive and affirmative scenarios. So what we can do 
in order, as the State Secretary um, has already said, in order to confront and to better anticipate the trends which are really, really uh, significant and unfortunately will follow. Please, please, madam. Thank you very much for, for these insights and, and questions, Ambassador. I should say, should say first that 30 allies are looking forward to 2030. They are looking uh, forward and NATO is now undergoing a reflection process. We are looking towards NATO summit next year in Madrid, a uh, new strategic concept because this is the basis. We need to have a structured, a solid basis, you know, a start, an updated picture, a comprehensive one about how the things are. And I think NATO is preparing in, in what I said, uh, in building resilience, enhancing resilience, because I think this is, this is the key. I, I enjoyed a lot the, the remark by General Everard, we are now in the post-Afghanistan, post-COVID, but we don't know tomorrow in which post something we will be. So this is another key issue, ambassador and distinguished audience, the capacity to anticipate. But it's very, very challenging. I think that you agree nobody anticipated crisis, the pandemic crisis. It was a shock in generations and with your permission, I will refer also to the implications for Southeast Europe, because you mentioned the region, not only the NATO countries, you know. And I should say that uh, geostrategic features of both Southeast Europe and Black Sea region have fundamental implications for your Atlantic security. And we have to be better prepared also in this region in helping our partners here and uh, be it allies, partners, you know, to, to elevate their capacity building and to um, promote a unitary strand of action in support of regional security. And I will also think that NATO-EU cooperation is vital. It has an important potential to support also regional security. Resilience, what we have mentioned earlier, countering hybrid threats, okay, including cyber, fake news, propaganda, as well as protracted conflicts approach are among specific areas towards NATO-EU cooperation should focus more. And we do hope that there will be a synergy between the strategic compass that the EU is now under development phase. We are expecting to have this approved under the French presidency next, uh, the first uh, part of the next year, and the NATO strategic concept. Because I think these are the fundamentals, you know. We have to distinguish very clearly which are our ambitions, which are our capabilities, and our means to accomplish our goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Someone else? Please, sir. I'm Harlan Ullman. Uh, I'm unemployed and unemployable. I have a question for both uh, General Sir James and the Secretary of State. Uh, when the United States uh, retreated from Vietnam, we developed an acute case of strategic amne amnesia and completely forgot all the lessons. I wonder for um, Simona, uh, next week marks the 20th anniversary of September 11th. What has uh, Romania learned over the last 20 years? What should it remember and what should it forget? And for General Sir James, similarly for NATO, over the past 20 years, what should we have learned, what should we forget, and what should we never forget? 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Harlan. <laughs> Uh, so I should start by saying that uh, back in 2001, I was a very young expert working in the Ministry of Defense. No, negative, ne I, I'm not. <laughs> um, and uh, I contributed uh, to, to our uh, policy approaches towards Afghanistan, towards our first deployment in such a theater of operation. It was a premiere for our troops in, in such a long distance theater. And I think we learned that insecurity became global, that threats could affect us from 5,000 kilometers, and our troops learned a lot in terms of interoperability, in terms of experience on the ground. Practically, we have been shoulder by shoulder to American troops, to British troops, and it was immensely contributing to changing our minds. Because 20 years, actually 19 years for Romania, of such an operational experience contributed a lot, if you like, to modernize our armed forces. And uh, moreover, I think 32,000 troops, more than 200 injured and 27 heroes means uh, extremely important contribution by Romania to our efforts in that approach that Romania is promoting in NATO and in EU like 360 degrees. This means solidarity. And at that time, Romania demonstrated that it wasn't a political rhetoric. We were there on the ground shoulder by shoulder. And it was you know, demonstrated also that Romania was a de, de facto ally, which was very, very important for, for a country like ours. Um, thank you very much. I apologize to the distinguished generals uh, if they want to uh, ask your question. But please allow me to go a little bit beyond my role here as a moderator and to try also to provide an answer to your questions because, um, well, I'm not so young as State Secretary, so I was there, like Shimon Perez told me in a moment, I was in the kitchen when you submit the verbal note, you the Americans, you submit the verbal notes, note asking for the Romanians to take part in the coalition of the willingness. I can tell you that now you see around you a lot of generals with a lot of stars, very significant uh, personalities of the military, Romanian military establishment. Maybe in that period they were colonels or majors. Captains. Captains, okay. Younger, please apologize, sir. So, in that moment, you realize that practically from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, I was Deputy Minister in that moment, from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we submitted to the political and military establishment, a request coming from the Americans. A very short one, a very brief request, saying, look guys, are you coming with us in the coalition of the willingness against terrorism or not? And I can tell you that, irrespective of some other periods in the history, political history of this country, in that moment, the political establishment and the military establishment, they said, yes, we go. You imagine, we are speaking about young military personnel trying to understand which are the differences between the tribes, in Pashtun tribes, between Pakistan, Afghanistan, whatever, in 2001. But they didn't send any type of inclination to uh, water down this decision. They took the decision and they went there. And I can tell you, I'm a career diplomat. 
I can tell you that uh, I should like to, uh, to say, okay, due to our political establishment or due to our diplomatic efforts, we succeeded to become members of NATO. No. Please listen from a diplomat. Due to their effort and their sacrifice. Please, someone else? Well, I, just to echo that point, there was a great quote from Antonio Giustiani, which said, we try to change the world without truly understanding it first. And I think, you know, when we left southern Iraq, we were still discovering tribes, you know, we didn't know uh, that, that existed. Um, on lessons, you know, we used to call it lessons learned in the UK, but then we weren't learning them, so we called them lessons identified, and that made us feel uh, a bit better. I mean, NATO has about 4,000 lessons learned in its, in its you know, lessons learned centre at the moment. Uh, and I think we've learned that we, that process just needs to run. And what we're really interested in are insights, four-star insights that tell us how we are going to have decisive advantage and exploit comparative weaknesses. Uh, and I think we're in a better model of identifying those uh, at the moment. Uh, I think two big lessons, you know, 1991 through to, what, 2014, you know, European or US power made it possible for... Europeans to think that military power wasn't important and we're playing catch up now. You know, we're still huge gaps in, you know, our ability, European nations to, to fight conventional war without the US. And I think we need to, uh, to close that down. Uh, and lastly, as a force generator, you know, nations don't like their forces to be fixed. You know, we've tried that model time and again. Uh, and I think uh, the new SACER st strategic directive which is based on the methodology of DDA and allows nations to come in and out when they see fit, working to a common methodology, is going to have much more success. So we'll see how that works. Thank you very much, sir. Please, uh, please, Emil. Uh, one of the things that we tend to forget, and it comes to your point, sir, is that uh, over the last 20 years, one million NATO soldiers, men and women, have participated in operations in Afghanistan. And uh, despite all the political hustle and hassle that will go on for quite a while, actually, I'm, uh, I, I fear, um, it is extremely important that we recognize those veterans and that we help them because uh, on, uh, many say, actually, that... Um, it brought them a lot of good things to be um, a veteran and to, to, to have been in the military. But unfortunately, it has also left terrible scars, uh, both physical and mental. And I think it is important that all the nations actually make sure that those veterans are not left behind. And despite all the problems that we have politically now, that we make sure that those soldiers are being looked after properly. Thank you very much, sir. I should like also to add to your comments. Um, between 36 or 39 countries uh, which take, took part in the coalition, uh, 49, sorry, in the coalition in Afghanistan, Romania, one of them, I can tell you that what was in our mind in the decision-making process was not particular the significance of the security of Afghanistan, but really the significance of the security of the United States. Please, another question, if it would be, or comments. It seems, yes, please. I appreciate Parliament, who didn't ask me directly, my friend, but to underscore some of the things that have been, been said to this point, um, first, I, I think we need uh, both uh, in the military, but in particular in our, in our policy domains, to, to go back to an understanding of warfare, uh, the realities of war we know from history, continuity of war, the nature of war, uh, that, it's, that it's unpredictable, that it tends towards violence, that it won't be what, you be in, what, it, what it is in the beginning. And, and that, I think, gave us trouble. Uh, throughout the time of Afghanistan uh, as well. 
uh, we're not well steeped in that. I think this goes to what uh, Sir James said about understanding uh, the fight that we were in. Um, in Vietnam, one of the lessons for me was is, uh, understanding the battle that you're in, uh, at the world that you're in, not the one that you want. I think we learned that again in Afghanistan, the very same, very same lesson. And then lastly, I would just say that underscore um, what the uh, chairman of the military committee said. Um, so many gave so much in this effort, and we must honor their eyes and recognize that and help them. Many that I have talked to uh, don't believe it was in vain. They, they know and saw the good that they've done there, uh, and they should be honored. And I think that's the point to make as well, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Scaparotti. Um, if it would be someone else who wants to address our meeting. Yes, please. No? It doesn't seem to be the case. Of course, I should like to start by warmly thanking the panelists, also our friends who practically addressed this very significant issue, which was part and parcel of the ideas and the subjects of this panel. It is something here, at least in Romania, we are confronted on a daily basis in the decision-making process. Either we are speaking about political or military situation, just without having the guts to say that uh, I can sum up what uh, have been said here. Just some points which draw my attention and I want to share with you again. Um, practically, dealing with the eastern flank is about NATO realizing that Russia's attitude toward the alliance is not going to soften. That Russia will continue to use cyber and hybrid warfare in order to intimidate not only the Central Europe, but also this part of, the, of Europe. And uh, practically, it's a bit trying to resolve in a way of another uh, North Atlantic alliance. And for the foreseeable future, we shall, we shall have the Ukrainian problem, also from the military point of view. So um, if NATO is to, com uh, to complete the task of bolstering the eastern flank, more progress, we feel the need uh, to be made in reconciling the different schools of thought among the member states, particularly in Europe. Geography and history here in Europe place us from time to time on different posi positions with regard to Russia. The concerns of the states here in the southern part will need to address equally, also from the perspective of solutions which are to be adopted by the political institutions, military establishment of NATO. Most capitals are concerned and prefer the national or European Union action to tackle the threats like terrorism. Migration was mentioned here also. And um, it is understandable from many respects that NATO is considering very seriously how they are going to devote their resources, taking into account different political approaches in this regard, a certain kind of equity and a certain kind of equal balance with regard how we are going as an organization to provide security to some regions, it should be also, at least from my point of view, extremely important. It was mentioned also Bucharest 9, and I hope that um, everyone in Romania who can practically support this initiative should work better from this point of view. Yes, it is important also for us to adapt and to initiate response capabilities, either on national basis, or, but particularly in cooperation with our partners. Resilience 
was a word which was used by all uh, three panelists uh, to anticipate trends, to, to have recovery capabilities without forgetting about partnership. Uh, yes, we have a resilience center in Bucharest. Uh, the, as I understood, it is at the very beginning uh, with this project. Hopefully, we shall benefit from the clever capabilities of the Romanian institution, but also your interest in NATO in order to develop in this part, geographically speaking, of uh, NATO such kind of institution, such kind of center. Um, from uh, our point of view, Practically, there are a few opportunities, a few opportunities with regard how to develop the response to security threats in the region. But at least from my opinion, the best the Alliance can do is to remain ready for more substantive engagement, to make demonstrable clear plans for it and uh, to remain dedicated to the idea that NATO, also for the sake of the interest of the countries which are not part and parcel of this region, should play a significant role. And from that perspective, the security of the South part of the Alliance should go on. But I'm very grateful to you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Thank you very much, distinguished gentlemen. I wish you all the best. Ladies and gentlemen, next. General Scaff, if you still have enough to Cindy, and I'll see you in London. <laughs> and I forgot, you are kindly invited by organizers of this uh, Indeed, uh, gathering, uh, yeah. having a glass of water and champagne, of course. Of course. Thank you very much. Right